What's up, War Report family? We are here. It's your man, Ike Jones. I got my man, C-Dub, in here. A very special edition of Building Report today. We have none other than the man from the QB school himself, Mr. J.T. O'Sullivan, to come in here and talk to y'all about quarterbacks. C-Dub, are you ready to have this conversation, man? Yes, I am. Let's get it started. Mr. O'Sullivan, how you doing today, sir? What's up, fellas? Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, no problem. We appreciate you popping in with us, man. We're going to get straight into some of these questions. Listen, um, we were talking a little bit off camera really quickly. I have to say again, I am a big 49ers fan. So I did watch your time when you were out there in the Bay, uh, had a, a career where you were able to go around to a couple of different teams. But of course, San Francisco is always the best team to ever play for in the National Football League. I don't know what your opinion is on that. I'm just saying as a fan, San Francisco. But anyway, we're not here to talk about that. What we want to do for our listeners is just get into an educational piece for them about what it takes to be really good um, from the quarterback standpoint. Of course, for college football athletes, it's a transition to high school. And I just want to start it off talking to you about what was it like in your transition from high school into being the guy there at school and, and getting the eventual starting position at school? Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so it's a good question. I think it's a, it was and even today can potentially be a significant jump. I think uh, that many young quarterbacks, depending on kind of where they fall as far as their development and their progression, can accelerate that nowadays. And you see that with guys coming in and being kind of three and out at the highest level. And so I think that gives the perception that, you know, everyone should be doing that. And the reality is that it's a very difficult transition for just about everybody. And so for me personally, anecdotally, I basically didn't play for two years. I redshirted and then I was the fourth string quarterback for two years. Hmm. And I, I was at a division two school. And so it's different for everyone. I think for the people that come in and play immediately, uh, you know, depending on what that situation looks like, not everybody gets to play quarterback at Clemson, you know, for their first year and come in there and, and be a five star and have that type of, you know, national spotlight and perform like that. And so I think it can be difficult. I think it potentially might be a little bit easier than it was, say, 20 years ago, just because of the landscape of football and the type of player that's playing quarterback. So nowadays, many times the best athlete will play quarterback. And, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I don't want to put you guys in a box and tell you, ask how old you guys are. But when I was growing up, the best player might not have always played quarterback. And so right. those days are really kind of different now. And so the level of athlete collectively across the board is probably better. The spread game has probably made the transition a little bit easier as far as some of the volume that college football programs are carrying and kind of what they're used to running at the high school level versus the college level. And so all those things play a factor. But at the end of the day, I think I feel pretty confident saying it's a difficult transition. It goes from being around, you know, young teenagers to being around many grown men right. and, and dudes that are out there that have been in the weight room for three, four years doing it the right way at the highest level. And so it can be a really difficult transition, especially if you get a chance to go out there and struggle or, mm. you know, stub your toe and that being able to bounce back, having that resiliency that you maybe never even face significant adversity, you know, depending on how elite of an athlete you were coming in. And so it's a, all those things can come into play to make it a difficult transition. That's why I'm always amazed at the guys that do it and are so smooth in their transition and are right into being elite quarterbacks at the highest level of college ball. So JT, man, we've done a few of these interviews. We've talked to former players. And one of the things that I have found personally enlightening for me is so much time, you know, and, and reasonably so we give a lot of credit and a lot of blame to coaches uh, for their responsibility in helping to develop these kids into what they're supposed to be. Right. But talking to some of these athletes, they talked about the fact that a lot of the onus has to be on those players as well as particularly this time of year where uh, there's no football. You're 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 out on a practice field. You're out somewhere with receivers throwing the ball, getting those reps in, getting better. Talk from your experience as to how that was very paramount for you getting into the league. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and there's a couple layers there that I want to peel back. Uh, so the first one would be. I don't think it's as ever as simple as people want it to be like, oh, we got to blame the coaching development or, hey, this player isn't bought in in the offseason. It's always both. Okay? And it's always difficult to figure out what that looks like as far as, you know, 
75, 25, what's the onus? Where's the ownership in that process? And so for me, it really depends. It depends on the player. It depends on the coach. It depends on the program. It depends on the level of accountability. So all those things matter. In, in essence, and in short, it all matters. You know, I tell our players nowadays, a lot of people think, hey, this is the off season. In reality, this is football season. Okay, mm -hmm. Even at the high school level, you know, school, we're into the next school year. We're meeting, multi, you know, hours a day. We're in the weight room hours a day. We're on the practice field hours a day. The off season where you make your big strides are when no one's watching in January, February, March, you know, when you're in the bubble by yourself. Those are the types of moments where you can really take those significant individual strides. Now, now, you know, especially coming out of a COVID year, you know, we're team building. We're doing things collectively as a group. We're, you know, installing collectively the, the time for your kind of individual development. You're to get with a guru, you know, you to do your like personal strength coach. Really, I mean, that, that stuff is almost over. We're at 4th of July. You know, it, right. it's football season. And so uh, I think it really does matter. I think most programs, even at the lowest levels possible, youth levels, understand that this is really a year round sport. You know, you young people might play multiple sports and that's great. In fact, I promote that they do. But if they don't, you're really in a year round program at just about anywhere nowadays. You know, they might take December off, but like it's 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 full go. And so I think people understand that. I think some systems are more efficient, better run than others. I think you can look at the longevity of certain programs and, and kind of be able to do that. But I think I don't think anybody would be, you know, doing themselves uh, the most elite kind of program building to say, hey, you know, we're not all in in the offseason. We're not doing everything we possibly can, even though that being said, I think some people do nutrition better. I think some people do strength and conditioning better. I think some people do explosiveness better. And those things, you can see the output of those on Saturday on Sunday, on Friday nights. And so it is part of a process, but it's never quite as simple as maybe fans or community members want to be like, hey, we got to get rid of this coach because our off-season program, you know, we got all these hamstring injuries. Well, uh, you know, yeah. there's so many, like you got to, you know, you peel back so many different layers to those types of questions. I think that they're important to have, but it's never quite as simple as saying, hey, we got rid of a coach, we get a new off-season, like we're going to get so much stronger. Like, all right. You know, we'll see. Yeah, that's really great. I mean, we, we've gone through a coaching transition here at Auburn recently, including the strength and conditioning staff. And so that's one of the things that we are hoping is that the program that we're putting uh, these young athletes through will help them in their progression. But let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff in that offseason program and specifically from the quarterback position in identifying uh, weaknesses that exist in your current QB. Right. So you're going to let's say you have a, a starter who started for you the previous year or previous years um, to now, and you're trying to get them into a better position as a starter for the upcoming season. And talk to me a little bit about some of the things that you do or you recommend being done for those quarterbacks to identify areas to improve and just to kind of help them get better at the small things that are necessary. Maybe it's not just, you know, how they're throwing the football, but just recognizing defenses like what are the things that you're doing during the offseason to help prepare those quarterbacks to be better when they come back out in the fall yeah that's a great question so let's just hypothetically play out what's happening in the auburn quarterback room okay you have a new quarterback coach new system new coach they're going to come in and say hey everyone's going to have the opportunity to play where it's going to be a competition uh, we're going to be able to everyone's going to start with a fresh start no preconceived ideas, even though maybe some of these guys recruited them at other places. There's probably some elements of relationship. You come in with a fresh start. We're probably going to go back and watch every one of your snaps that you played last year together. So we're going to have some sort of an evaluation about how you played last year. Then we're going to be able to take that skill set and figure out what's going to fit in what we're going to do. So maybe it's a different scheme. Maybe there are different elements of throws. Maybe there are different patterns and recognition that we're going to ask you to do consistently. So we're going to teach you the new stuff while we evaluate you off your old stuff, but we're going to allow that relationship to build on the practice field. So it's going to be continuous and it's going to be hard to know what the output is until you see the performance through a, through a significant body of work. And for me, that's a month in football. So like four games, you're going to be like, okay, this is the big change. This is where they've spent their time. 
Now, maybe he's coming out in the media. People are coming out in the media saying, you know, what he's working on, what he's not working on. But I would imagine, for me, most quarterback coaches, especially knowing the, the little I know about their background, where they're from, they're going to teach the quarterback position almost like every position in football from the ground up mm-hmm. and the top down. So you from the ground up, you're talking about footwork, base, uh, drops, timing, rhythm, those types of things from the quarterback position. And then the top down, you're going to talk about a combination of things. Obviously, the schemes, the X's and O's, which might be totally different, which might be right. a lot more, a lot less. Uh, but you're also going to be talking about leadership. You're going to be talking about influence. You're going to be talking about uh, your role on the team. You know, is there a competition? Who's fighting for the backup spot? You know, all those types of things are going to be into play. And it's all new personalities. So it's like going to a new school. So you got to learn to fit in. You got to adjust quickly, but you got to compete like hell. And it, and those things are constant, right? Like those never change. You, you know, you guys alluded to the fact that I bounce around the league quite a bit. One of the things I can tell you about bouncing around the league is that it's like that everywhere. Mm-hmm. You walk into a room at any position group and everyone is competitive. Everyone wants to play. Everyone thinks that they're better than the guy who's playing. And if you think you're the guy, if you're the guy playing, you think that you deserve more money. So it's like, there's never, that never stops. And so it's about being able to maximize your individual performance in whatever your coaching situation is, whatever your program situation is. And this is the hard part. This is the part about football and elevate the collective group. So if you play DB, you got to elevate the room. You got to elevate that side of the ball. You got to elevate everything that they're asking you to do coming up, making a tackle, all those types of things. Same thing with the quarterback position. You got to elevate the room. You got to compete like hell. But if you're not the guy, you got to be a great supporting cast. You got to be a great team member. You got to be a great, you know, advocate on the sideline, all those types of things that are just really tough when you have a new staff. You know, they're coming in, they're all jacked up. They want to make a change, a culture change, a scheme change, and it just becomes a lot. And so you got to filter all that information out and realize, especially if you play quarterback, like you're going to be judged on what happens on those Saturdays. And right. so you need to play at a high level and you need to give yourself a chance to win, especially in that conference, in that division. You know, it's, it's no joke ball. JT, you said a, you said a lot of great stuff there, man, especially finding a guy who can elevate the room. And it, and it at least appears in the offseason that the coaching staff is doing that. They brought in a transfer kid out of LSU, which a lot of fans hope at the very least can create some competition to elevate the level of play in that room and and to create some focus there in your experience you've seen the number number one guy get chosen you've seen some some great competition you've been a part of that competition Uh, you've won your fair share of competition uh at, at times in your experience when the coaching staff selects the guy there are a lot of different things that they're looking on looking for depending on what they're expecting or what they're trying to run schematically and this guy gives them coach speak the best chance at winning and doing what they're going to do but being behind the scenes and and having a detailed uh or or a firsthand experience what are some of the things that you've seen that when a coaching staff selects a quarterback as the guy in order to be the guy to lead the team what is that one thing that that quarterback has to have yeah it's a good question the unfortunate answer is that it's never one thing, right? Like, I mean, that, that, that's all these things where it's, uh, it's way more nuanced than that. If I had to break it down to one thing and we're going to, I'm going to kind of like separate, like obviously has to be able to throw the ball, like can function uh, at the high enough level to run what we're asking them to run. For me, when I've been in those types of situations, and this is strictly for the competition element in the quarterback room and really any, any position group, they're usually going to go with the person of course, they're going to say that gives them the best chance to win, but really it's the person that they trust the most. Mm-hmm. So uh-huh. they need to trust you to do whatever they're asking you to do, because not all offenses are the same. Sometimes yeah. you're going to go out there and be asked to hand the ball off and do some play action. Sometimes you're going to be asked to go out there and spread it around and make plays and be a point guard. Sometimes you're going to be asked to go win a game. Like you got to be the best athlete on the field. And so whatever that is, it's whoever they, and this is the same thing that I tell even to our high school players, is the number one thing you need to do when you're trying to fight for opportunity on the field is to earn the trust of your coaches. Allow them to be, you to be so good that they can't take you off the field. Hmm. You, that, that locked in. And so 
many times in these competitions, I'm trying to think if I've ever been in a competition where I was like shocked at who they picked. Normally, mm. the cream rises, right. you know, and, and, and people in the room know. And people on that side of the ball know. The coaches know. Now, you have to, you have to be given a fair shot. I've definitely been in situations where I'm like, right. Yeah, I didn't even get a shot. You know, like I'm talking about like a real competition where you're getting 50%. You're, I'm getting a third. You're getting a third. He's getting a third. Those situations, if you allow themselves to play themselves out and you quantify and you show and are transparent in the process, I can't think of a time where it wasn't clear who should be playing. And so, you know, that's the other part about it. It's, I remember being a young person, a college player, even a high school player, and someone would transfer. You know, like you get a transfer or something. Well, you almost have to operate under the, that's going to happen every year. Like they're going to recruit mm -hmm. someone. They're going to get a transfer. If that, if you are fortunate enough to go to the league, there's going to be free agency. They're going to try to upgrade your position every year. That's just part of the deal. And so you need to be able to compete for your job and elevate your performance and play at a high enough level where they can't take you off the field. And yeah. so it, it's easier said than done, but I just feel like, in many of those situations, if they're done well and people are transparent, and that's the other part. If you're in those competitions as a player, you just want your coach to tell you the truth. Like, hey, you're fighting. You're going to get a real opportunity. These are your reps. This is what it is. This is what we're evaluating. You know, are we evaluating completion percentage? Are we evaluating turnovers? Are we evaluating who moves the ball? Are we evaluating, like, what, what are we measuring? And then let me go compete. And that's all you can ask for is that opportunity and, and to make the most of it when you get those opportunities, because you won't get very many of them. Well, JT, I, you know, that, that kind of brings me to mind about a thing um, that you hear about a lot. And I just want to know kind of the reality of that from a uh, higher level sports of you hear about a guy who's a good practice player, right? Like they do all the things right on the whiteboard. They do all the things right in practice, but they can't seem to put it together on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Whether it's Friday, you know, high school football, Saturday, college football, Sunday, professional football. Is that a real thing where, where guys, they, they excel in one area, but then when it comes, bright lights are on, they're just not able to put it together. And how do you deal with um, trying to figure out or evaluate who is the best person when the lights come on? Is that just a trial by fire? Like what, what do you do in those situations? Uh, I, I think that there can be elements of that. In my experience, uh, the best players are the best practice players. You know, there's, I, I can think of a few people that would be maybe more comfortable in a practice situation that for whatever reason, and I'm going to generalize it here, but what my experience has been is that the game is just too fast. And that's at any level. And so you might be able to make sense of it on a whiteboard. You might be able to make sense of it in seven on seven. But now that mm. everything's going full speed and I can get hit, it's just too fast. Yeah. And, and I think everybody, you know, they're oh, off the top of my head, what's it called? Uh, Peter Principle. So this idea that everyone has the ability to be promoted to a level that they cannot succeed. So like you've mm. been promoted to a job that you just can't do. And so there's mm. an element of football where maybe – you know, you're just, you can't process fast enough. You don't have the arm strength. You don't have the athletic ability. You don't have whatever variable that you need to be able to perform consistently. The opposite side of that is that you might have someone who's a quote unquote terrible practice player, which usually means that they have some concentration issues or, you know, something else might be bothering them. But in the game, they're just a playmaker. Like they just make plays. Well, I get nervous with that type of stuff because a lot of that to me is kind of like the more that they are out there, there's always an element of regression to the mean where like you're, you are who you are, you know, like if you're a bad practice player, you're probably might just be a bad player. Uh, and, and if you, you know, and if you, so in, for me, I, I get really nervous when I, when I see things like that, it's just, I'm looking for, especially at this position, quarterback position, you're looking for consistency. Right. Like you, anybody can go out there and have a 400 day, one Saturday. Right. You yeah. got to be able to do it every week and then you have to be able to do it every year and then you have to be able to put a career together. And so it's the body of work that I think really separates a lot of guys. And so, you know, that's the thing about it. I, I don't know how you evaluate that other than allow them to have as much live opportunity as possible, whether that's, you know, 11 on 11 in practice, whether that's live, you know, spring games, whether that's, you know, 
blitz period, whatever you can manufacture for as most game-like situation as possible. But I, the, the other part that I want to be really explicit about is I've been around a number of guys that I would never put on the whiteboard. Hmm. And what I mean by that is they just, that's not how they, that's process not how they the process. That's not yeah. how they're going to excel. Mm. So why is a quarterback coach or an offense coordinator, what I want my quarterback to be up and on the whiteboard, embarrassed, usually in front of his peers, that he can't really quickly draw up a play and, you know, tell me what the read is versus certain defense when that doesn't matter. You know, all he needs to know is that we're reading the C-gap defender or we're reading, you know, the, the safety. And so for me, it's about creating that confidence, putting our players in the right situation to be successful. But I've been around a number of quarterback coaches who, for whatever reason, maybe don't like a guy or are frustrated with someone and will go out of their way to put them in situations that aren't growth situations. Like there's nothing, there's nothing growth situation about putting a, a potentially like significantly dyslexic guy on the board and asking them questions that they're barely learning an offense in front of guys who have done it for a decade. Right. It's just not, it's not cool. And so that, that play, that plays part of it. And that's how you start getting the narrative about, you know, struggles in the classroom, struggles with the scheme. Well, you know, there's a lot of guys who I would classify as, you know, maybe aren't the greatest teachers or educators in those situations to put those players in situations to be successful. And so I'm always super hesitant when I hear about a player, you know, struggling with the scheme, struggling with learning it, because I really feel like if they're taught well and given enough chance over time to be successful, you know, there's an opportunity for just about everybody to thrive in those types of environments. JT, that leads me to to this question. Um, and you you, you kind of touched on it in terms of being consistent, right? Uh, practicing a certain way all the time, right? Um, your, your output may be different, but you're you're approaching the game consistently the same way. Right. And you're talking about giving these players a fair chance to succeed. And is there a, is there fundamental issues in a person's play? If there are some things that needs to be corrected and coached up, are there certain things that just can't be fixed in a QB or in a player? If it's something that's fundamentally lacking in their game, is there something that a coach even after giving them a fair shot, is there something that a coach can just throw his hands up and say, I'm not quite sure if I can fix this in this kid? For sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and that, that gets into the the bummer part, especially when you're transitioning staffs, right? There are probably a number of people there that they didn't recruit. Yeah. And so, you know, th that part of it, for sure, I just feel like uh, more often than not, that is not the case, especially at the high – the power five level, you know, many, many times those guys can play, you know, maybe every once in a while you get something that you just swing and miss on a recruit. But if you're getting an opportunity to go out there and get a, you know, power five type athlete, you should be able to at least have them be a serviceable member of your program. Now, if you're talking about lower levels of football, there are things that I can't coach in a quarterback. If you don't have the arm speed to throw the ball, you know, there are things we can do to talk about generating more torque and more arm speed. But, you know, you guys have all probably been to a tailgate and played catch with someone. And you're like, you know, <laughs> that ain't, you know, that, that ain't it. Like, like there's nothing I can do for that person. Like, there's right, nothing right. I can do. And, I, and right. I've also been around quarterbacks that just don't have the capacity to do what this system, whatever system, X, Y, Z system is asking them to do. They just don't have the capacity. They don't they, either they don't care or they can't learn it. And so it's either you got to be able to fit the system to be adaptable to the skill set and the capacity of your quarterback, or you have to move on. And, you know, it's the coach's decision to make that decision. But it's, you know, at the highest levels of football, you know, there's certainly a gap, right? When we're talking about like the top five guys in the league playing the position. Mm -hmm. But then if you look at like power five football, and let's just assume every power five program has at least four quarterbacks damn near all of them, you know, except for the elite of the elite five-star guys, they're all pretty good. Like they're all pretty damn good. And what, what you make of that, how you coach them, how they perform, how they fit into your system, how they develop, you know, over the course of four years, you know, that's the thing that I always tell young people is, 
people always, and this is a famous quote, I'm paraphrasing it, but people always underestimate, people always overestimate what you can do in a year and underestimate what you can do in a decade or five years. And so for your college career to be five years, you can make significant growth if you're in a situation that allows you to develop. But you look across the landscape of college football nowadays, and, and I think that the, the time frames are accelerated, you know, the, the expectations are accelerated, even on players, let alone coaches. And so everyone feels that pressure, everyone feels that tension. But I, I still feel like, man, so often, more often than not, if you're given the someone who's got the capacity and got the skill set to play, if they're given an opportunity to flourish and develop in a correct, positive environment, there's a chance for them to become really good. Hey, this is this is good stuff, man. Um, I, I hear you talk about game speed, right, for players. And and one of the things, you know, kind of going back to something that C was talking about um, is feeling the rush. We've talked to uh, – we had a former Auburn quarterback on here, Chris Todd, talking about just the ability to uh, – uh, it, the the fight or flight response is what he talked about when you've got this, you know, 300 plus pound guy who runs a sub four or five running at you full speed and being able to just stand in the pocket and take that um, on a consistent basis, but still deliver. Some guys have it. Some guys don't. Um, is it something that can be taught to a player to learn how to do that better? Um, or is it just simply a function of, you know, the biology that they have is like some people can and some people can't like, is it something that you can get progressively better at with being able to have a better presence within the pocket? And does that just come along with the speed of the game? Just talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I would say it's both. I would say, yes, it absolutely can be taught because I'll, I'll give you anecdotally how it was taught to me. And then I think that there are some people in there that have the capacity to just keep their eyes down the field a little bit longer that don't worry so much about, you know, color flashing in front of their face for whatever reason. And I think of like guys like Ben Roethlisberger, yeah. like when he was young, he's just a, he like a redwood tree back there. It didn't matter. Like I see guys bounce off him. Well, mm. you know, for me, if I see color flash, I might be a little bit quicker to get the hell out of there, you know? And so it's just a different, you got to know, play to your strengths to a certain degree. But I remember being a young quarterback and having really uh, unsolicited, is a nice way to put it, feedback about saying like, hey, you know, you got happy feet back there. You're, you're leaving too early. And then you turn on the film and you're real with yourself and you're like, you know what? I am leaving too early. I am getting flushed out of there. Maybe I got hit hard once. And then the next time I see color flash, I'm out of there too early. And so it was really, for me, it was a combination of someone giving me real feedback and me saying, you know, I want my film to look like I'm a courageous guy. So I'm going to stay in there. I'm going to slide. I'm going to hang to the last possible moment to deliver the ball. And it's one of those things, too, where, you know, it's maybe not every single pass play. Maybe it's the got to have it third and long. Maybe it's right. the big play action shot. Maybe it's just the ability to slide and be fluid within the constraints of the pocket. All those things, you know, kind of come into play for me. I definitely think it can be learned. I think that there are some guys that just, no matter what you do, they're going to bail the first thing they see. And they just, they, either, either they don't like the physicalness of the game, but that's probably for every position, you know, especially you, you see certain guys are more physical than others. I think certain quarterbacks specifically are probably better football players and certain guys are just better throwers or like the idea of being quarterback better right. than they like the idea of getting smacked. And so that's just part of the position you play. You play. And nowadays, especially with the quarterback run game and how important that is, in many levels of football, trickle all the way up to the league. You know, you got to be a great athlete. You got to be able to lower your pads. You got to be able to run between the tackles. You got to be able to slide, protect yourself. You got to have that football IQ to know when those moments are called for. And so, you know, I, I would totally agree that it is something that is, you know, when you watch it on TV, I think a lot of fans are like, God, he's bailing out of there. Or like, you got to, you know, he looks scared or things like that. And I think sometimes that is the case. And I think it can be learned. And I think it really needs to be intentional. You know, I always kind of chuckle when you see quarterbacks. I'm not a huge drill guy. You see guys like jump over bags and like got crazy cones and stuff like that. There's an element of that that I think is important to be able to specifically for quarterbacks to kind of keep your base as you move so you can throw quickly. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, you look at like Tom Brady, the greatest to ever do it. He's all about that one slide over smooth 
stay compact, move within the pocket, buy time. You know, it's not a whole lot of like figure eights over cones, turning around backwards and throwing. It's more about manufacturing the pocket, knowing what your strength is and being able to deliver the ball accurately on time down the field consistently. JT, talk to me about how important that scheme plays into this quarterback's clock and his timing um, and how it's important, especially at the at the highest level. You're playing against some of the elite of the elite in terms of defensive lines, uh, defensive coaches who knows how to bring pressure and decrease that clock a bit. How important is it for a coach to come up with a game plan? And you know it's not 100% guaranteed. You're going to find yourself in third and forever situations or third and long where defenses will pin their ears back. But to the best of their ability, how important is it to, to come up with a scheme that will allow the quarterback to, to be able to make a quick play or progressions or being able to – uh, read the defense in a way to where they're not back there as a sitting duck. Uh, talk talk about how important it is for for coaches to to help their quarterbacks in that regard. Yeah, it's critical, and it, and it's critical. You see it across the landscape of the league and college football, where you see a lot of these quote unquote young offensive guys getting these head jobs, and it's because you know it's for a number of reasons. But let, let's pretend that it's about one reason that it's. They are creating quarterback-friendly systems. So the league is quarterback-driven. The highest levels of football are quarterback-driven. All these offensive rules give an a advantage to the offense, and so you need to be able to take advantage of those by what your scheme is. And you touched a lot on probably the most important element of it that's often the least understood, and that is how the pass game is tethered to pass protection. And so what that looks like as far as timing, as far as getting the ball out of your hands, as far as health. I mean, we you talk all the time about your best ability is your availability. If you're getting smacked all the time and you're not in there all the time, there's usually a significant jump from the starter to the backup, specifically mm -hmm. at the league level, but even at, at every level, there's a significant jump. And so keeping your quarterback upright, and really that comes from a number of different things. It can be scheme-based. It can be play-caller-based. It can be yeah. being able to be multiple enough. You know, you see a lot of screens. You see a lot of RPOs. You see a lot of big play actions. You know, there's not a whole lot of old school under center drop back anymore. And that's because there's a number of reasons why for the rule changes and different ways to attack defenses. But having a quarterback understand what that is. And for me, it's always about teaching the quarterback, you know, what is the intent here? Are we taking a shot? Like, are we big fake, take a shot? If it's not there, check it down. Or are we stretching the defense horizontally? Do we, we want the ball out of your hands immediately. You know, is everybody blocked? You know, what's the expectation for the offensive line? All those types of things need to be really explicit. And I think they are at the highest level. But when you come to scheme, it's a combination of scheme, obviously being adaptable enough to have all those things. But then the play caller and the plan needs to be multiple enough to keep those people guessing. So like even when you say, hey, they're going to be in third and long and they're going to be able to pin their ears back. Well, third and long sometimes to me is the best time to throw a slant because if we complete a slant, it's 11 yards. You know, and so yeah. the, just a different way to be able to what is the priority? You know, I've been around a number of play callers that uh, we've had some struggled up front and they will be watching the offensive line more than they're watching what's happening down the field. They already know. You know, they only play a couple coverages. We know what to expect versus XYZ personnel. You know, what's happening up front? That will dictate what we do in the run game, in the pass pro game. You know, are we being multiple? Are we doing five-person protection, full, you know, seven, eight-person big play actions? I think being able to be multiple in that and change the launch point of the quarterback, that's another thing we haven't talked about. So back in the old school days, you know, you take a drop back, you're right over the center. Well, nowadays, you know, you're quarter rolling. You're getting, you're moving the launch point of the quarterback. You have, you can be multiple enough to not let those guys who let's face it, you know, are freak athletes. Defensive linemen nowadays are just oftentimes unbelievable athletes. And so to take the edge off them, you can do it a bunch of different ways, but I think scheme and play caller really do play a, a important vital role in that. I can tell you, I've been around a number of play callers where I'm like, man, this guy is fun to play for. Like he gets the rhythm the cadence, mm -hmm. he's aggressive, he stretches the field horizontally and vertically. And then I've been around some guys that are like, 
man, this guy thinks that, you know, we're in a closet. Like it's just, you know, handoff right, handoff left, you know, doing the opposite of what I would want to do. And so I think there is a feel to it. I think that there is an art to it. I think that there is a planning element of it, of being really strategic and how we're going to attack and where we're going to attack and be multiple enough to do it. But shoot, man, nowadays, offensive football is so exciting. And there's so many different ways to attack people that if you're not multiple, you really feel like you're just hamstringing yourself. Yeah, you actually touched on a couple of things that I was going to ask next about just, you know, playing with an offensive line that's struggling um, and just kind of some of the things that you can do to be able to, um, as a play caller, be able to to do that. But I do want to kind of take it from the opposite direction a little bit about the symbiosis between uh, what a quarterback can do to help a struggling offensive line. So just outside of what the play call is or what we're doing to roll our um, protection or we're going to be changing, you know, max protect, whatever we're going to do to try to help benefit, you know, if it's a chip on a defensive end that you know is, you know, elite as coming off of the edge, you know, we can do those things from a scheme standpoint, but are there things that the quarterback can do to help an offensive line that is not doing so well in, in protection up front um, to, to help them either on a play to play basis or even game to game to get a better kind of idea of how we need to be able to attack defenses? So, yeah. So the answer is absolutely. Uh, the the first thing I would start with is before the snap. Okay, the, the the oftentimes you'll talk to offensive linemen who think that they're getting beat and they think that the defensive line is getting a jump, right? So changing up the cadence that's a mm. simple thing, right. really. And if you guys have, you know, I'm sure I'm sure you guys have played ball. It's a simple thing, but you know you fall into the rhythm of hey, it's on one, it's on one, it's on, and then like every once in a while it's on two. Well, as opposed to making that multiple element of the snap count a weapon. And you can see it at the highest levels. Like everybody always thinks Aaron Rodgers, you know, mm -hmm. there, there's a number of ways to be able to do that, to take advantage of it. It's not a joke. It's not an accident. You know, Brett Favre was great at that. And that's where he learned it from. It's a, it's a yeah. weapon that quarterbacks need to use and it needs to be emphasized. The next thing is that you know, there is an element of you have to be a football player. You have to be an athlete. If someone comes through, if you have the capacity to make one guy miss, get outside the pocket and throw it away, that's often a win. You know, when, the, when there's a pay, uh, breakdown in protection. Now, it's even better if you can make somebody miss and get vertical and get some yardage in the run game. But I can't tell you how many offensive linemen I was around. And I was by no means like an elite athlete when it comes to like compared to guys who are on an NFL field. But I can make somebody miss and fall forward. You know, and I make somebody miss fall forward. It's two yards. It's second and eight versus second and 17 after a sack. Right. And so – there's an element of building trust with the offensive line to know that they don't have to be perfect, that you might have the ability to bail them out. From the coaching standpoint, you know, you don't get to do this in high school, but in college and the league, if you get outside the pocket, you just throw it away, right? Like, mm -hmm. just get outside the pocket, throw it away, bail, throw it away. Like, an incompletion oftentimes is a win. If there's nobody winning downfield, you're not going to force a ball. Just get outside the pocket, make a good decision. You hear all the time about make a good decision. In fact, I've been around a number of teams in college and the league that would, you know, oftentimes you look at a box score and you'll see a quarterback, like which hypothetically 20 for 25. Well, inside the house, it might be 20 for 22 with three throwaways, mm -hmm. you know, cause that's the real, you know, throw, we're counting throwaways, you know, as a completion percentage, but really that's not a, we're not a true attempt. And so getting into like the details of what that looks like for the quarterback position and having it promoted, you know, that's the other part about it. Uh, promoting the quarterback to save a play. Oftentimes we'll tell our guys, you know, don't make a bad play, a disaster. All right. So mm -hmm. if you, you know, sometimes you're going to get sacked. All right. Sometimes you get sacked, but don't make that bad play a strip sack. You know, yeah. don't make that bad play a contested interception. And that's the part where you really get people fired and get people losing their jobs <laughs> is when, right. when those types of things happen consistently. And so I think you just be explicit with the quarterback. You teach them how to protect a play caller. You teach them how to help a play caller when something breaks down. The other thing that, that I think isn't talked about quite enough when we're talking about real football is that many of the reads, like you, you see people like, it's a full field read, one, two, three, four, five. That's seven on seven. Hmm. Like that's just seven on seven. Like that. So rarely are you going to go one, two, three, four, five. Oftentimes, especially at the non NFL level, it's one, two, run. It's one right. run, maybe. You know, like that's just the truth. Like if you program the quarterback, hey, don't be back there taking three hitches. It's one, two, run. 
I, I think you really help yourself and help that offensive line unit feel like, hey, man, we don't have to hold on to our rear for like 10 times a game. We're, we got a couple opportunities. We're going to take shots. Everything else, we know the ball's getting out quickly. JT, a, a lot, as we mentioned before, has changed with Auburn. New coaching staff, new system, just a whole new different way of how we're going to attack defenses in the fall. And it appears as though the quarterback, the O-line receivers are being asked to do a whole lot uh, pre-snap and as well as after the snap in terms of their responsibilities. Uh, there's a lot that they're going to have to do to, to assess as opposed to looking over to the sideline for, for guidance. Talk to me about the transition of, of, of how a coaching staff will do that. How difficult is that? And oftentimes do coaching staff find themselves simplifying as the season goes along so that these guys can catch on? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I probably think of it from both sides. So the idea being that right now they're learning a new system, being asked to do different things with kind of different guardrails or scaffolding, right? Like in the past, everyone was peeking over and we would just change it on the fly, where now maybe they've got a little bit more robust toolkit at the line of scrimmage. And it's just a philosophical approach about which way you think allows you to be most successful most often. You know, for me, and then the other part of that question was, will it be more simplified at the end of the year? And I don't know if it's more simplified. I always think of it as like a reverse, like a funnel, right? So we're at installation. We're going to install everything in the summer. We install everything. So you have a baseline. Now, when we play, we're not going to have everything in the game plan. Right. So that game plan, we want to be like the best of the best for that week versus that opponent. And I think the best staffs have the ability to do that and make it look different every week. Uh -huh. But that teaching part of it, I mean, I'll, when you're at the top of the funnel, that feels like you're drowning. You know, yeah. that feels like I'm speaking a new language. Uh, I don't understand what they're asking me to do. You've got different expectations, different blocks, different responsibilities, different assignments. And it can feel like a lot. But I think good coaches recognize that, but then are always tapering it. So like, hey, this is what we're going to do today at seven on seven, or this is what we're going to do today in run period. So focus on that, stack those good days. And then at the output, you've got a game plan or you've got a plan mm -hmm. to attack whoever you're playing. And so for me, I want the most robust funnel possible. I want everything in the thing. Now that's just me playing and as a coach, but I know some people are like, hey, we're scheme. We're only going to have this little bit of what we do, but we're going to be great at it. But even that is a little, it's just a smaller funnel. And so I want the most right. robust funnel possible. I want to be able to do all those things and then have it tailored to our players, our scheme versus X opponent and be able to be multiple enough for that to change all the time. And I think sometimes when people think, hey, you know, he's an air raid guy, he's a whatever guy, you know, he's a West Coast guy in the league, he's a digit guy. Most people have the capacity to do everything. It's the right. people that can interweave those things on a mm -hmm. weekly basis to be creative, to scheme people open, and just to take advantage of. Sometimes, this is my best dude, he's getting the rock, okay? He's getting the rock all the time. And then when he's tired, our other guy is coming in and he's going to get it. And good luck trying to stop us. There is an element of that too. So it's this combination right. of of being multiple, but also being like, hey, let's not over let's not over uh, complicate this thing. Let's just be able to give it to our best guys, consistent as possible, and let those guys go be them. So, uh, just um, one more question for me: um, how how do you feel about um, the use of things like an armband, right? When you're like, as a, a, a guy, so you played the quarterback position. Did you ever have to do it? Did you like it, dislike it? Um, and then conversely, as a play caller, you know, um, is it something that you feel like makes the guy more comfortable? How do you feel about the use of the, you know, calling it in on a sheet type of thing for your quarterbacks? So that's a good, it's a good question. It's, it's almost like a philosophical thing. For me personally, uh, first I'll give you as a player, I was indifferent to be honest with you. Uh, I think it makes it a little bit easier as far as your preparation. Sometimes you don't have to worry about like, hey, are we running this play out of this formation with this motion? Whatever, bro. It's on the wristband. Like I can just read right. it, you know, like whatever. That part of it makes it easier. I think that there, the part that I dislike about the wristband is that it's hard to go off the wristband. So mm. if you've got, if you've got hundred plays on three sheets, you've got 300 mm -hmm. plays that you can call. Well, all of a sudden they're doing something we didn't expect. 
So now I want to change and be adaptive in series, in game, at halftime. What am I going to give you like another wristband or are we just right. going to like scrap it and do something else? Right. So right. It, it unnecessarily, not unnecessarily, you are bounding yourself. Hmm. You're putting your own guardrails on what you're going to be able to do. Now, 300 plays sounds like a lot until you realize that, you know, you've got four minute offense, two minute offense, all your third downs, uh, left hash, right hash, middle, you know, the, those types of things all of a sudden it's not that much. And so for me as a play caller, our system is built to be adaptive. Now it's obviously a lot more simple than an NFL type system, but like it's whatever you value is really the end of the day. And so the other part about it is I say all that and I've used a wristband as a coach. I've used a wristband as a player. I don't really think it impacts the outcome very often more than just, Hey, if, if someone's struggling with the playbook or they're brand new into the system, let's just get them a wristband. I, I can tell you oftentimes a little cheat here for all the quarterbacks who listen to this or anybody who's interested in ball. Oftentimes I would ask my coaches for a script, get the script, cut it out, put it on a wristband. Hmm. So like you're at practice. Yeah, I got it. I got the script or sure as hell. It would have the defensive call on it too. You know, like there it is. And so the, there are elements where I feel like, you know, it makes life a little bit easier just as far especially when you get into the wordy calls. But I don't think it necessarily impacts the output more than just you lose that adaptive nature, a DNA of an offense that can be able to change all the time. JT, final question, and it's a fun one. Some states players are, are now able to to profit off of their name, image and likeness. And it would have been nice if, if, if they had this when you were playing in, in college. But hey, it is what it is. What are your thoughts on the direction that college football is going and the impact it can have in terms of recruiting and competing at the highest level? Man, you are hitting me on a sweet, sweet spot. Uh, <laughs> this has been this has been a this has been a long time issue for me. Uh, I used to be a little bit more outspoken with it when I was in college athletics, but this is a long time coming. I mean, really, mm. it's uh, college athletics for a long time have kind of been built on this idea of amateurism. That's really faux amateurism at the highest levels mm -hmm. at best, and it's been accelerated by the fact that these coaches often predominantly white coaches coaching non-white players making millions of dollars you know the look of that the moral the morality of that uh just doesn't add up and so now the idea that these players at least begin to get this opportunity for name image and likeness is a nice start i think it will eventually uh you know get in move even farther to where we're actually you know paid a fair wage for what they're being asked to do. I think that they, for the longest time, and many people, you know, you probably many people all the time use the term student athlete without realizing the history of what that is and how that was created with the idea to basically not pay someone insurance, you know, there that we've been called, they have been college athletes for a long time. Uh, the, the term student is, is a faux term and oftentimes not a faux term, Many times these players are college athletes. They're, they're there to play sports and it's their choice. And the edu it's tethered to the education system in America. Hmm. And I think some players get the opportunity for an education. But when you hear terms like, hey, they get a free education or, you know, they get X, Y, Z free. In reality, they don't get the same educational opportunities that many full time students get because their practice schedule right. doesn't allow right. them to take the classes that they want. Their practice schedule doesn't allow them to be a full-time student. I can tell you someone who was a student athlete and then went back to school as just a student, being just a student is kind of fun. You can actually <laughs> do the reading. You know, you can be prepared. You know, you can value the educational experience. It can be very fulfilling. But when you're a student athlete, it's really hard to do both really well. Yeah. And so, you know, th that's the part for me. This is a small step. College athletics has been broken for a long time financially. Uh, I'm just looking... I, I had such a great experience in college athletics that I want other people to have that opportunity. And the way that the system is created right now, especially at the highest levels, it's difficult to replicate that opportunity. And so I'm, I don't pretend to have the answers. It, right. In fact, you know, I don't think anybody really has the answers other than the fact that we need change and we need it quicker than it's coming. I think it's been a bummer that the NCAA hasn't been able to lead the change, but I think right. many people who have been in the space for a long time 
have known that the only way that we're going to get significant change is through the courts. And, you know, this past week was a step in that direction. Still think we have a long way to go, but, I, but it's exciting to at least see the college athletes start to recognize their individual power, their worth, their value uh, to what they're bringing to this sector and just looking for college athletes to get their, you know, what they're owed and what they're due in, for what they create in the space. Man, that is, uh, you said a mouthful and a half, and I definitely appreciate the, you know, the perspective that you bring to that. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot here. This wasn't even a planned question. I'm just going to put you on the spot. Can you, and we talked a little bit, and you, know, you don't get an opportunity to really watch games anymore, but can you tell me top three play callers right now that you would say, man, this guy is innovative. I love the way that they call plays, put plays together, play design, all that kind of thing. Can you just spitball off the top of your head? <laughs> well, I mean, I have such an ego. I would put myself in that. No, I'm joking. Uh, I would say, you know, the guy, uh, I'll answer it by the guys that I would probably want to play quarterback for. Yeah, there we go. Uh, I would probably want to play, I've been for some reason watching a lot of UCLA and I think I just fell asleep about what Chip Kelly has been doing, but I love what he's doing kind of quietly with the Bruins as far as their scheme. I always feel like he's, I like my, being around guys that are a little cutting edge that are kind of like, you know, I don't see that a lot of other places. And then like three years later, you see everybody running it like right. that. And so right. I always feel like, I always feel like he's pushing the envelope as far as what we're doing offensively scheme wise. Uh, the other guy that comes to mind immediately is Ryan Day. I, I just think he, for a long time, has been what I consider quarterback friendly. You know, a lot of people would be uh -huh. like, you know, you can everybody's quarterback friendly when you got Justin Fields. But I feel like what they do and how they take advantage of the college game and the RPO space with the screen game, with the throws down the field, I just think that would be a fun offense to be a part of. I think in the league, you know, I think everybody would, would probably say Shanahan to a certain extent. I'm sure there's somebody that I'm missing. I mean, anybody for me that I feel like I always use it as who can scheme people open. Right. So anybody, you know, you know, the three of us, we could probably go be the coordinator at Green Bay, you know, and be all right. You know, if we if Aaron's playing, you know, he's going to make right. anybody look pretty good. Now, I'm, that's no disrespect to those cats. I'm sure they work really hard and do a lot of things, whatever. But there's a w level of play guy that he's going to make anybody look pretty good. I like core, I like coordinators and play callers that when you watch the play, you're like, that dude is wide ass open. Yeah. You know, how did that happen? Especially on Sundays. Now, Saturdays, you might get guys open a little bit more consistently. But even Saturdays, you know, it's hard to get separation. You know, you play a, uh, you know, a, a Saban type defense that's going to play some variation of man match. There's going to be a dude close to that guy, close to your eligible every play. And so when you can scheme people open consistently, and then down the field. And then I just, I gravitate towards aggressive guys. I just, I think it's fun to be, push the ball down the field, be smart with it, be able to protect the play caller. So I would probably go Chip Kelly, Shanahan, Ryan Day. All right, before we get out of here, man, we definitely appreciate all the time that you've given us today. Um, tell the people where they can find you. You've got the YouTube channel. I know you're doing the high school athletics thing, but just if people want to get in touch with you about some of the insights that you've given us today, tell them where they can get in touch with you. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. It was fun talking ball. The, uh, the easiest place to get a hold of me is YouTube. That's kind of the generator. That's where everything kind of starts from there. We have a Patreon community. And then if you're really looking to take your ball to the next level, I always kind of drive people towards the courses. Got a couple courses uh, on RPOs, how to beat every coverage, and then the pass protection course, which I just feel like I'm trying to create content that I wish was available when I was thirsty for more ball. And so that's kind of the generator. So YouTube and the courses. Okay, that was it. Our man JT O'Sullivan with the QB School here giving us some insights. Great conversation with him today. Uh, we are the War Report. Listen, you already know what's going on right here. If you want more great content like this, you better make sure you are clicking subscribe right down there on the channel. You can become a member of the channel as always to get some of the insider content we're going to be providing you in the future. As always, we are the War Report on Instagram and Twitter, and we are TW Report on TikTok. That's it. We are signing off, and as always, War Eagle.